Hello, good morning. Uh, this is uh, Srinivas Sridhar from Boston. Uh, and uh, I, it is my pleasure to tell you about uh, um, our work uh, in uh, the area of nanotechnologies for precision medicine uh, with a focus on cancer. I am presently the director of the Nanomedicine Science and Technology Center and also distinguished professor of physics, bioengineering and chemical engineering at Northeastern University. Uh, and I also hold an appointment uh, in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Harvard Medical School. So this talk, I'm gonna be uh, discussing our applications uh, our, uh, of nanotechnology in um, cancer. Um, I do want to mention that um, um, I have uh, created a small poll to uh, understand the makeup of this present audience. I'm now going to push that poll out to you. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, this, is, this poll is intended to uh, you know, get a feeling for uh, the composition of the audience uh, please respond. I'm going to leave it open throughout the talk, uh, and then I will publish the poll at the end of the, um, uh, the uh, at the end of the lecture. So, the um, so in order to give you a bit of a context uh, in which this work is being done at Northeastern University. Uh, I, the nanomedicine science and technology is part of the Electronic Materials Research Institute that I started in 2005. Uh, the key thrusts of the center and the institute are research, primarily in nanomedicine. Uh, we have a strong portfolio in education in nanomedicine uh, that uh, I will tell you about at the end of this talk. <clears throat> We have established a nanomedicine core facility that is critical to the uh, work that I will describe to you. And uh, uh, the other key aspect of our um, the institute and the center are the partnerships. Um, these are uh, not only local with the um, uh, hospitals uh, in the Boston area, and as you know, uh, we have one of the biggest medical research complexes in the world. Uh, and we're right uh, a part of it uh, near the Longwood area in Boston. Uh, but in, in addition, we collaborate with industry uh, and academic partners, not only nationally, but also internationally. So uh, one of the critical aspects to the work I'll, descri uh, I'll describe to you is the ability to uh, to characterize nanomaterials for uh, medical applications. And we have an extensive uh, facility at Northeastern that we've established over the last several years that is used not only internally, but also externally. And so the typical things that we test for, this is uh, as far as the physical chemical properties go, are listed on the left, left here. Uh, and on the right, I list some of the technologies, the, the instruments that are used to um, test these properties. Uh, I have not also included here, but that's also a part of the work, the in vitro uh, characterization facilities and our in vivo animal uh, studies. But I will be showing you results on that uh, during this lecture. These are some of our partners uh, that have uh, uh, we have worked with over the years. I want to particularly acknowledge the top line where I list our sponsors over several years. Um, and then there are various the hospitals and then other companies and universities. Now, I want to start this talk by telling you why is nanotechnology relevant now uh, in and in, in the context of uh, medicine this I would say 
has crystallized over the last 10 years, um, which is when we started, you know, our nanomedicine program here. Uh, and so there are actually uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, historical reasons uh, or trends which have enabled nanotechnology to be applied to medicine uh, today. And the first uh, is let's look at the the sizes of various objects. Um, on the top, I show you uh, the sizes of various naturally occurring entities. For instance, the DNA base and the, the DNA turn is around three nanometers. Uh, then you get to proteins. You're then in the 10 uh, to 100 nanometer size range. These are large biomolecules. <clears throat> Uh, viruses are larger entities um, and bacteria are several uh, microns and, uh, and bacteria and cells are much uh, are microns and larger and of course I could have extend this on to um, organisms and, um, and and on to humans and the largest mammals uh, such as elephants so nature uh, has the biological, uh, biologically relevant entities in nature span the range from a tenth of a nanometer onto uh, several meters. Now, what has happened over the last uh, 50 years or, or so, <clears throat> and that is accelerating um, uh, uh, you know, on a daily basis, is that <clears throat> we are able to make uh, synthetically uh, uh, controlled structures at um, on the nanometer scale ranging from less than 10 nanometers onward to uh, several microns and I list some of these nanoparticles here gold nanoparticles micelles <clears throat> nano assemblies liposomes and so on and beyond that these can further be uh, assembled into larger structures as you, as we have shown here now uh, and this is really the development uh, that has occurred over the last several years that has enabled uh, nanotechnology to be applied uh, to medicine but this is only one of them so the nanotechnology revolution <coughs> that um, uh, has occurred has essentially three parts to it. One is the ability to design nanostructures. And I show you here a couple of um, entities, which are, uh, this is a DNA template, uh, a DNA-based nanostructure. And then these are some other biomolecules. Uh, and, and on, uh, you know, we now have the ability to actually dial in capabilities and construct various uh, structures and just design them. Well, if you design them, you can also, the next uh, is to be able to make them. So making nano is the next step in the uh, nanotechnology revolution. <clears throat> and uh, uh, these are done primarily in two ways. One is top-down nanolithography. Uh, which is, of, um, and the other is bottom-up self-assembly. Now, in the top here, I have shown <clears throat> it's a photonic crystal structure that we made in my lab. This is uh, a, using, you know, conventional nanolithography, where you cut down from large sizes on down. The other, this is a micellar structure, uh, and we're looking at the core of the micelle. Uh, this is done from bottom-up self-assembly. <clears throat> and uh, what we uh, so here uh, you start by uh, uh, putting this is largely wet chemistry and you put together the constituents and if you have the right conditions you will achieve the structures that you need and I'll show you some examples of structures later on now it's not enough just to design nano and it's not enough just to make nano you also want to be able to see then. And that's the third leg of the revolution that has occurred. Um, 
the uh, what is critical today to this kind of work is the availability of a range of microscopes <clears throat> atomic electron optical and I show you here two examples of using these microscopies uh, it is so routine now to take make nanostructures run them over to an uh, uh, an SEM or TEM in order to under, to characterize them and look at their uh, you know, their morphology so what um, so with this, what is nanomedicine? Nanomedicine is the application of uh, nanotechnology uh, to challenging medical applications. And I believe, and, and so do uh, a lot of uh, other people, uh, and including the you know the funding agencies and also. Um, uh, the uh, governments across the world that nanomedicine is poised to make uh, major contributions to <clears throat> uh, uh, to uh, therapy and diagnostics. And so, what are the key uh, applications of nanomedicine? Um, they include in vitro diagnostics, uh, and here are some examples of. Um, uh, uh, quantum dots you, in cells um, so that you can look at uh, cellular processes. Um, in vivo imaging and diagnostics. I've only showed one part of that here, uh, which is <clears throat> um, imaging using uh, uh, nanoparticle contrast agents. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that later on. Uh, this can all, but you can also do uh, ex vivo diagnostics where, you know, you do uh, draws of body fluids and then run them through um, for biomarkers. And in the process, nanotechnology uh, almost always plays a part. In uh, one of the critical areas uh, is the, is the, uh, ability to deliver um, drugs and other biological entities to the disease site. And for that, nanotechnology is absolutely essential. The, um, the uh, and, and these are exact, and I will show you our work in this area. And this is all led to the concept of Theranostics, that is um, multifunctional nanoplatforms that combine both diagnostic capabilities and often carry um, various entities. They could be drugs, they could be uh, entities that can uh, be used to deliver energy uh, so that you can do uh, both diagnostic, uh, diagnostic imaging and therapy. So these are, uh, this leads to the uh, concept of nano platforms for precision medicine, um, and this and this has three components to it. Firstly, uh, early diagnostics. I think everybody in this audience appreciates the importance of uh, diagnosing cancer um, as early as possible. Today, we diagnose cancer at anatomical signatures. Um, that is, at, you know, millimeter-sized tumors or larger. What we need to do is to catch it. Uh, uh, now, at that time, millimeter-sized tumors is something like a billion cells. We need to catch it uh, when it's much smaller, maybe at a hundred cells. So how, uh, or a thousand cells even. So how how are we going to get that million-fold improvement? And that is primarily going uh, to come from nanotechnology approaches. Now, once you've diagnosed the tumor, you obviously you know, want to avoid the, uh, the, the systemic toxicities that are really complete feature of um, therapy today. I mean, you know, I think you all understand that um, when you think of cancer therapy, you think of 
the first image that comes to mind is, oh, hair loss. And, and that's a totally irrelevant consequence. It has nothing to do with the disease. It is only has to do with the therapy. Uh, cancer therapy today is defined by toxicity. Um, and so you have the concept of, you know, MTD, uh, maximum tolerated dose, uh, rather than the efficacy of uh, the therapy. And in order to improve the, uh, the therapy, clearly targeted therapies are essential. And nanotechnologies play a critical role in this. Hopefully, once you know, the idea is that you diagnose the disease, you, um, you then administer your drug, it concentrates in the disease site. Now, after this, you want to do real-time monitoring. And um, for that, again, nano platforms play, uh, will play a critical role. Uh, there, uh, this is an area that is an emerging area. Uh, and uh, uh, I will talk about some of the ways in which this can uh, happen. And of course, our hope is that the end, you'll, uh, the patient will emerge disease-free. So in order to achieve this, we need several levels of precision. We need geographical precision so that you can home in on the, tum on the tumor. You need cellular precision because you may want to um, uh, address, you, you may want to, uh, to target uh, subcellular organ, uh, uh, organelles like I mean, uh, mitochondria or the nucleus. And beyond that, even when you um, uh, have achieved your subcellular, you want to target specific molecules, uh, for instance, genes um, uh, or inhibitory pathways. Um, and so there are several levels of precision medicine that can be addressed by uh, nanotechnologies. So <clears throat> I um, so how do, so in a, the way we proceed about uh, nanomedicine research is actually we start with the medical challenge, whether it is. Um, for instance, for precision tumor targeting um, or radiation oncology, which is one area that I work in and I will talk about, um, or localized energy delivery, for instance, uh, deli uh, triggered uh, um, hyperthermic chemotherapy uh, uh, or hyperthermia, for instance. Um, so we start with a medical challenge, uh, and then we go backwards from that, uh, and we design the nano platforms. And at Northeastern, <coughs> we have a whole range of nano platforms that we have developed. I would say more than 50, uh, or maybe even approaching 100. <coughs> These include polymers, lipids, organelles. Um, uh, so, uh, various self-assembling amplifiers, magnetic nanoparticles is a, an area that we have worked on extensively, uh, metallic nanoparticles like gold, uh, I will give you examples of how they're used, both of them, quantum dots, now quantum dots are really primarily for ex vivo um, because as they are at present, uh, they contain heavy elements and they are not going to be used in uh, humans. Um, we are working on developing some green quantum dots. <clears throat> and but this doesn't, is not restricted only to, um, to uh, nanoparticles. We also uh, have uh, developed, and this is another large area uh, of application, which is um, nanoporous coatings on implants. <clears throat> and basically preparing uh, implants uh, to be biocompatible, uh, to do drug delivery and things like that. Now, if you make them, you have to characterize them. And so we have an extensive toolkit, characterization toolkit, I mentioned briefly earlier. Now, all of this, of course, 
has to at the end, uh, use uh, some form of biology. Uh, and it may be apoptosis. Uh, it could be, I mean, endocytosis is one of the common me mechanisms of nanoparticle uptake. Um, and, and, but that is primarily used to get the drug or your biologic into the cell. Uh, then you may uh, want to do gene silencing uh, and use um, short interference RNA, for instance. Um, and siRNA is typically delivered with nanoparticles. Uh, so you do have to have an understanding or, of the biology in order to use these nanoparticles in order to achieve the medical challenge that you uh, are uh, aiming to address. So I will run through some examples of this in this talk. Um, and uh, so this talk is going to be essentially in three parts. The first is I'll show you some uh, applications of nanotechnology for radiation oncology. Um, and I will talk about two uh, developments that have occurred in my laboratory. One is smart implants for local chemo radiation therapy, and the second is gold nanoparticles for radiation uh, that will use to enhance radiation therapy. Then I'll talk about multifunctional magnetic theranostic nanoplatforms uh, and how they're used in MR contrast enhancement, magnetic targeting. Uh, magnetic triggered chemotherapy in, in multimodal imaging. Um, and then finally, I will, I will mention briefly our efforts in nanomedicine education and training. We have established the first nanomedicine uh, doctoral program uh, since 2005 at Northeastern University. And um, uh, and uh, that has already graduated several uh, trainees and we're developing new programs uh, and I'll briefly summarize them at the end. So um, let's start with this and um, I, I want to start with part one which is nanotechnology for radiation oncology. Uh, we have several, this is a close collaboration between Northeastern University uh, primarily my center, the Nanomedicine uh, Science and Technology Center, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, this is a collaboration led by uh, Mike Makrigorgos and Dana-Farber and myself. Our primary pro projects are PARP inhibitors uh, for chemoradiation therapy, um, local chemotherapy, which is also we call it biological in-situ image-guided radiation therapy, golden nanoparticles, and the more general issue of radio geno radiation genomics and genomic instability. I will primarily talk about these, uh, these middle two topics. There are several accom accomplishments of this, um, and you can also find a link to this in my website. So, uh, the first part of this uh, talk, uh, in the first part of the nanotechnology for uh, radiation oncology. This is work we've done with several uh, people, um, so, some of whom are uh, Rajiv Kumar, Robert Cormack, Mike Makrigorgos, Anthony D'Amico, Paul Newen, and myself. In radiation uh, therapy, <clears throat> the uh, there are two principal ways of uh, treating cancer. And as you may know, uh, roughly 60% of cancers are actually treated with radiation. So it is a very commonly used modality. And uh, the, one, the two typical approaches are, one is external beam uh, radiation therapy, and the other is brachytherapy, where small seeds are placed in the uh, in, the, in the disease site, uh, particular, uh, whether it is the prostate or, or breast or a variety of um, other uh, solid tumors also. This is done through an image-guided um, procedure 
Uh, and these procedures have been well developed and, and they're um, uh, well established and essentially part of the armament of the radiation oncologist. Now, both of these procedures use um, some kind of a, a, a marker. In the external beam, it's a fiducial marker, it's a gold pin. In the case of brachytherapy, they use small spacers besides the radioactive seeds. The question we asked and we have addressed is, can we make these uh, spacers, spacers and fiducials, which are currently inert, all they serve, the only purpose they serve is for uh, geographic location. You know, here you want to know where is the tumor, um, and here uh, you want to space out the seeds. Uh, so they serve no other purpose. We want to make them smart by releasing drugs and biologics that will enhance the radiation therapy. But the same procedure can be used without radiation also, so that it can be used entirely for local chemotherapy. <clears throat> so what we have designed and, and con developed and have deployed in preclinical experiments are what we call insert implants. These are implant, the insert stands for implantable nanoplatform for chemoradiation therapy. Uh, this work is primarily done by Rajiv Kumar and Jody Bells along with our collaborators at Dana-Farber. So what we have here is um, we take a spacer, the brachytherapy spacer, uh, which is typically shown here. Uh, here is a commercial spacer. It's typically around uh, eight uh, millimeters uh, long and about one millimeter in diameter. Uh, here is our drug-loaded uh, spacers um, with two forms. One is uh, it's an encapsulate, physically adsorbed, and here we have conjugated system. So what is inside here in these uh, loaded platforms are usually nanoparticles. Um, they may be of various types. Uh, this example here talks of silica nanoparticles. What happens is that when these are placed in the tumor, the uh, matrix degrades, it releases the nanoparticle, which then releases the drug. So this is a dual release platform. Um, and um, the, the key point is that the release is over many, many days, as you can see here. Uh, we have uh, watched this over 30 and even longer um, days. Um, and the reason for this is we want the drug release to be synchronous with the half-life of the radioactive seed, which is around uh, 60 days. You can see here that we put a dye into these spacers and put them in mice, and you can see how uh, they're visible even up to 14, and even actually we've carried this on to many more days. So they sit there and release slowly. Well, well, does this have any therapeutic benefit? And so that I show here, um, we have carried out a, a whole, uh, a, a fairly thorough um, animal study. Um, and I will, uh, so we have done, the treatment groups are control, no treatment, blank spacer, one dose of taxotere or da docetaxel. So the, what we're using here is docetaxel is the, is the frontline chemotherapeutic for prostate cancer after, uh, typically after radiation um, and also in conjunction with radiation. Uh, so we use, give one dose of um, docetaxel and and then that's in one group, and then the last group is with the spacer. And then we also do blood chemistry.
So here are the results. You can see here um, the controls, of course, the tumor. So this is tumor volume over days. The control grows, you know, without um, control. And then typically we have to sacrifice the, uh, the animals here. Uh, the single dose of um, uh, docetaxel, uh, the IV administration also does not arrest the tumor. And you will see that it has some nasty uh, toxicities. The, uh, uh, the, on the other hand, the drug-loaded spacer uh, not only arrests the tumor, it actually then, if you extend this on, it shrinks it. And we have animals that are now tumor free for more than 120 days. This shows you the toxicities. Um, you can see that uh, the, uh, the, uh, drug the spacer implanted animals are very healthy. Uh, in fact, they increase weight. Uh, whereas when you, with these, the docetaxel injection, immediately you get a hit. And this hit lasts for days. Now, in fact, in humans, once you give the therapy, the docetaxel, you have to wait two weeks because the patient is heavily neutropenic. And then only you can administer again. Um, so the drug, however, if it's administered IV, clears out within a day. Whereas with the spacer, it is acting continuously. So does this have, so how does this all play out, you know, in, uh, as regards survival? Um, at 40 days, um, we have, um, uh, for the local th chemotherapy group with the spacer implanted, 89% of the mice survive at 40 days, whereas with the control and with the IV docetaxel, there's 0% survival at 40 days. And uh, here is the, uh, here's how the mice look. Uh, you can see that for the spacers, at four weeks, the tumor is gone. There is a um, ulcer which also uh, clears out uh, at eight weeks post-treatment. For both the dose of IV and the control, um, the tumor is growing. Um, and uh, more importantly, you can also see here these animals are really weak. Uh, the IV docetaxel is, is, is very weak uh, due to the heavy neutropenia. So, um, I, so this is very promising results for, um, for uh, the local chemotherapy. This is, uh, I should have added that this is PC3 tumors in mice. And because we primarily see the, the first tar, uh, application in prostate cancer. So what are the advantages of this? We're delivering drug locally. It's sustained uh, delivery over over many days, uh, typically 60 days. Uh, whereas when you give inter, uh, chemotherapy, uh, you, you, systemic administration is given intermittently. We can tailor the release profile to synchronize with radiation therapy. We can give, we can do, do local dose multiplication. That is where 100% of the drug is in the tumor. And importantly, we completely avoid the systemic toxicity. So the, importantly, there's no ad, imp, um, additional inconvenience to the patient because this procedure is already happening, is already in place. And you can use it without radiation, but with radiation, the idea is to reduce the radiation dose to get a bigger bang. And those are experiments that are ongoing next. Uh, so this cartoon summarizes, if you give intermittent uh, with chemotherapy systemic, you have to give, you know, spikes. But here you get sustained chemo uh, radiation, synchronized, uh, the, uh, it, uh, the chemotherapy is sustained and synchronized with the radiation. We can put in any number of other biologics and we can all, and then there, in addition to prostate cancer, there are any number of other uh, uh, cancers where brachytherapy is also used that we can use this process. So I am now completed uh, talking about uh, part 1A of my talk. This is, these are some of the publications. You can look them up. Uh, and I now want to move on to part 1B 
which is gold nanoparticles as radiation sensitizers. Uh, what happens here is that the uh, the ra so if you have gold nanoparticles and you have radiation hits them, not only is it the radiation acting on the rest of the tissue, but the gold nanoparticles will release electrons, which will then lead to reactive oxygen species and lead to additional cell kills. So we have shown in calculations that you can get an enhancement of as much as a factor of three when you add gold nanoparticles um, and they are located in the tumor, particularly in the epithelium. So this is a very promising way of sensitization and uh, we have developed now third and even fourth generation nanoparticles which uh, it's, a, it's a complex structure where we have gold nanoparticles with a polymer brush for long circulation. They have peptides to uh, target the uh, the tumor. Um, here is a uh, SCA, the uh, transmission electron microscope of the nanoparticles. Here they are in cells. They enter cells very nicely. Uh, we had a fluorophore that you can see here. Um, you can see inside the cells. This shows the in vitro radio sensitization. And basically, when you combine gold nanoparticles and radiation, you get complete cell kill. And the enhancement of the cell kill is shown here uh, with a, a significant boost. So um, uh, what I show here are that these, uh, the, the nanoparticles nicely target tumors, both in orthotopic pancreatic cancer and in transgenic lung cancer models. And so we now have the gold nanoparticles at the tumor site and we're now doing irradiation studies in order to see the efficacy in vivo. We have already demonstrated in vitro. Now I want to turn to part two of my talk and I'm uh, going to have to speed up because this is um, uh, so as to finish on time. So the next part is we've developed theranostic magnetic nanoplatforms. Uh, we start with iron oxide nanoparticles, and that's because these are um, biocompatible. We have a large number of nanoparticles, but they're not really um, biocompatible uh, magnetic nanoparticles. They're uh, biocompatible. Uh, the, their biocompatibility is. Um, uh, is very important and iron oxide are well established. The, now, as by themselves, they're, they're not any good for in vivo administration, so we have to do a whole bunch of functionalization. The, uh, we have put gold on them, uh, and this is to to be able to use the thiol binding of um, gold. We have put polyelectrolytes to con uh, control their charge. We have put uh, various entities uh, uh, like uh, antibodies on them. And we have encapsulated them into several platforms. Uh, this is a nano emulsion. Uh, and this is a micelle. Uh, and this is a uh, core shell system. These three are, they have hydrophobic cores so that they can be used to encapsulate hydrophobic drugs like taxanes. The other uh, major carrier uh, for magnetic and other uh, entities is, are liposomes and we have made magnetic nanoliposomes. Um, and these, these actually can be used for both hydrophobic drugs like adriamycin and also hydrophilic drugs. So the way uh, the liposomes are lipid bilayers and they are really wonderful carriers because they have an aqueous core where you can put in aqueous drugs like adriamycin. You can put um, hydrophobic drugs in the uh, lipid bilayer and, and uh, uh, 
you know, we have encapsulated a variety of hydrophobic drugs like taxanes. Uh, we have attached, so typically they always have a polymer brush. We have attached radio labels. Um, the, we have attached um, fluorophores. We have attached antibodies. There's a large number of publications on this. Um, so we have made a whole range of, uh, uh, we have encapsulated a variety of drugs, including doxorubicin, vinblastine, etoposide, um, GDNF, and also siRNA. So these are used for magnetic targeting. Um, the, uh, 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 and, and we can do that through charge and through magnetism. Uh, we can do, we've delivered various drugs and we can do multimodal imaging. Now, I'm going to take a second here and uh, uh, just note, which is something I should have told you before. If you want, uh, this is a CME accredited event and you can click on the CME button uh, on the lower left to get credit. So this is just a reminder for those who want to get a CME credit for this. Okay, back to liposomes. So, um, these are very efficient drug delivery vehicles and my collaborator Bob Campbell has shown that you can deliver vinblastine uh, in a, a B16 um, F10 melanoma model and you can target by applying a magnet, you can target the drugs to the tumor. Uh, and I'll show you some, an example of that in a second. And when you do that, the tumor is completely arrested. Uh, and you essentially, uh, uh, and it also minimizes uh, and eliminates metastasis. So by magnetic targeting, you can, complete, you can greatly improve the treatment outcome. This is shown, we actually visualize this here, uh, and this is published in this paper. So on the left, you have uh, a, a control mouse, uh, well, uh, where we, there's a tumor here on the flank. Uh, again, this is a melanoma model. You, we administer the liposome, magnetic liposome with uh, vinblastine. And you can see that it accumulates in the tumor through a process, uh, and I should, have, uh, I should mention this, nanoparticles accumulate in tumors passively uh, through a process called uh, the enhanced permeability and, uh, uh, and retention effect, where essentially they, leak, uh, they uh, leak out of the leaky vasculature. So they extravasate out of the leaky vasculature into the tumor. So you get some enhancement in that. However, when you then put a magnet on it, you know, here, uh, and you leave it only for one hour, you actually get a multiplication of a factor of three. So magnetic guidance increases the tumor accumulation when you have magnetic liposomes uh, by a factor of three, and you get much greater drug. So uh, now, I think this is an important point. Going back to that issue of drug uh, targeted therapy, we can go, if you typically administer a drug, less than a, a tenth of a percent or so accumulates in the tumor. With passive targeting, you can get up to a few percent typically. With additional things like antibodies or magnetic targeting, here you can actually get up to 15%. <clears throat> and so now we've got significant uh, drug delivery um, accomplished. Uh, <clears throat> and so instead of um, uh, almost improvements of anywhere from 10 to 50 times. Now, um, these uh, <coughs> magnetic liposomes can also be radio labeled and they're very efficient SPECT imaging agents as you can see here. Um, now, one thing I wanted to tell you is that typically, so how does, so how does, <coughs> going back to this, how do we, how are we visualizing the magnetic nanoparticles here? 
Uh, and that is because through an, what happens in, in this kind of conventional imaging is the, um, the nanoparticles go dark, uh, make the area surrounding them go dark. So you have negative contrast here. Uh, this is the, the way this works is that uh, the nanoparticles affect the, uh, the uh, water around them and so they make the uh, greatly reduce the relaxation rate um, and increase the relaxation time. So it stops responding and you see a dark spot where the nanoparticles are. So that's how uh, magnetic nanoparticles act as um, contrast agents. However, we have now developed a process where we can get positive contrast. So you can see here that uh, before the injection of the nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles, you can see essentially nothing um, with this technique, which is we call it QCE for quantitative ultra short time to echo using contrast enhancement. When you inject the nanoparticles, you can see beautiful uh, vasculature being rendered. Everywhere, the nanoparticles distribute completely in the blood, and you can see them uh, exquisitely. Uh, we have shown that not only can you visualize them, but you can actually do a quantitative assay. And that is uh, in this paper in Magnetic Resonance in Medicine that just came out earlier this year. <clears throat> and I refer you to that. We're doing a lot more with this uh, in uh, both, uh, uh, you know, vascular imaging throughout the body and also in the brain. Uh, now, I want to briefly touch upon another system because um, we can do something more with magnetic nano uh, nanoparticles <clears throat> that is described here. We have, this is a core shell system uh, that was published uh, in this paper in Theranostics. Um, and uh, the key point is these are, well, very reliable nanoparticles, but what's important is that if you take these magnetic nanoparticles, you put them in an AC magnetic field, then they can, you deliver energy to the magnetic nanoparticles absorb energy, and then they, that breaks, it, breaks up the nanoparticle and releases the drug. And that is shown here in uh, in vitro experiments. Um, so that, you know, you can see um, with just five minutes of this, uh, uh, of this heating, uh, and it's not really a temperature rise, by the way, it's only, it just delivers local energy. Um, you can see a release and then 20 minutes later, you get more of the drug uh, uh, released from these nanoparticles. And so now you can actually, so what we have shown, uh, which gets me to the next point here, is that with these nanoparticle systems, we can do, we can deliver a whole range of uh, chemotherapeutics, biologics, uh, and I didn't get into others, we're delivering PARP inhibitors to the disease site. We can get them there through passive targeting, uses the enhancing, uh, using the enhanced permeability and re retention effect. We can do it with antibodies and peptides. I showed you the example of peptides in the uh, radiation oncology uh, with the gold nanoparticles. And we can do it magnetically with magnetic nanoparticles. So we can get these to the disease site. They will then release by themselves. Uh, through enzymatic degradation, um, or uh, you can actually deliver energy uh, locally and break up the nanoparticles to do triggered release. And then you can combine it with radiation therapy and actually any number of other therapies like photodynamic therapy, focused ultrasound, and so on. So we can do all of these th uh, therapies. We can also simultaneously monitor the nanoparticles with, with uh, MR, I showed you MR, spec, and optical. Uh, we, we've also uh, uh, conjugated PET ligands uh, so that you can do multimodal imaging. And there's a reason for this. And the primary reason is today, if you go to the uh, operating room of the future, 
at Mass General and, and Brigham and Women's Hospital, they have combined MR and PET. But the markers are on the table. Here we can get the fiducial markers, uh, which are these multimodal nanoparticles in the uh, person inside in the aorta uh, and not on the table. So that greatly improves things like registration. So this is the sort of overview of multifunctional nano platforms for precision image guided therapy that we're pursuing in my uh, center. Um, I chair the nanoparticle imaging working group at the National Cancer Institute. And we recently published a paper that I'll refer you to that discusses all the advantages of um, nanoparticles in imaging. Uh, um, and however, in order for the nanoparticles to get to the clinic, there are several barriers that need to be overcome. And these barriers are also described there um, in the paper and briefly in this and are summarized in this slide. Now, um, so that completes the research portion of this talk. And I want to move to my third topic. Not only are we researchers, we're also educators. And I'm passionately committed to nanomedicine education. I started the first interdisciplinary nanomedicine program anywhere in the world at Northeastern University, thanks to funding from the National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, uh, we won the award first in 2005 when nanomedicine was not even a well-known name. Uh, and um, then um, the, uh, uh, the uh, and then we won it again in 2010. Uh, and so we will continue this on and now we're going to establish a standalone nanomedicine PhD, uh, the first of its kind anywhere in the world starting in uh, next year, 2015. Um, this is in collaboration with several institutions. The key highlights are shown here. Uh, we, have, uh, we have trained 45 PhDs and uh, more than, and much actually more than 36 um, BS and MS trainees. This is a truly interdisciplinary program. We actually now have developed four new courses uh, you can see all of this in my website um, listed here, and, and I'll show that at the end. Um, and these are some of our um, uh, graduates. We're very proud of them. They've gone on to uh, uh, you know, very successful careers. Um, now, that was primarily doctoral. We got a new, we have, thanks to a new grant from the National Cancer Institute, we're also now training undergraduates so that they will be uh, so we're establishing the pipeline to train the next generation of cancer researchers and clinicians. So I'm going to close here. Um, and um, I want to, uh, first of all, thank my numerous collaborators and sponsors. These are my collaborate, principal collaborators at Northeastern. Uh, there are actually many more students who also contributed. I want to mention my principal collaborators at the hospitals. They're critical to our, um, they bring the medicine to this. And everything I do is in close collaboration with clinicians. And of course, the funding agencies uh, who have made this work possible. Um, these are the various uh, the, the, the centers uh, and institutes at Northeastern that have made that uh, under which this work is done. So I want to, uh, first of all, thank you all for listening. Um, and uh, you can find further information at these two websites, and you can write to me. Um, I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, you know, hear, uh, be very interested to hear from you offline also. Now I want to, first of all, close the poll and um, and then I guess I, I'm going to try and push the results out. So to give you an idea, 67% um, of the audience, two thirds of the audience is uh, our basic researchers. 10% are clinician, uh, clinical researchers. 
Uh, I, uh, there are no clinicians as such uh, on, on the, in this audience. And then there are several who do not fit into this uh, category, any of the above categories. Um, so I'm going to close this also. And uh, I would next, uh, I would like to address some of the questions. And so let me um, scroll through here. Um, there are several questions that have showed up. Um, and uh, let me uh, start with uh, some questions. So, mm, look through here and um, um, so let me go through these, uh, try to consider, uh, look at these questions. So let me, um, uh, let me start with uh, a question here on the dimensions of the gold nanoparticles. So the question is, what are the uh, gold nanoparticle, uh, I mean, what is the um, dimension of the gold nanoparticles? And uh, just one second while I'm trying to see whether um, I can uh, see the rest of the question. Uh, and okay, so I, I, I can see a part of the question, which is, um, what uh, what is the dimension? So that the gold nanoparticles themselves are around twenty to uh, so twenty nanometers or less. Um, I want to add that uh, anything below five nanometers will get cleared out. Uh, Yes, I'm sorry, the question is visible here. Uh, what about the dimension of nanoparticles related to the toxicity within biology, biology systems? And that's a good question. The gold nanoparticles are, uh, we make several types ranging from two nanometers to 20 nanometers. Anything less than five nanometers actually gets excreted out through the, uh, is urinated out, so through the renal system. Anything bigger is retained inside the body. Now, gold is the, uh, after iron oxide, gold is pro probably the most um, biocompatible material, and that's why we use it. Um, uh, you can, uh, and again, we're talking about, you know, people uh, uh, getting it into tumors. Um, these are, can be, uh, I think they can basically sit there uh, without any long-term uh, damage. Um, also, they are typically removed out by uh, nanoparticles, uh, by macrophage, uh, macrophages. Um, now, um, another question I will address is, uh, for, is uh, from Colombia, and uh, what would be the risk of accumulation of nanoparticles in the body organ failure new tumorigenesis? Again, you have to, as I said before, we only use biocompatible nanoparticles. For this reason, we don't use quantum dots, like which has selenium and, and cadmium and things like that, heavy metals. Uh, we're very careful to use uh, or essentially all the other components are is already FDA approved. We're putting them together. Uh, we uh, almost always avoid um, any excipient uh, entities which are not federally approved. So um, I think the risk of organ failure and new tumorigenesis is uh, you know negligible and uh, will be minimized. Um, do, do we evaluate liver or kidney toxicity? Uh, indeed we do, and I didn't get into it here. I want to add that the local chemotherapy has almost no systemic toxicity outside of the tumor. The, when you deliver systemic drugs, they do accumulate in, typically in the liver, um, and but they're and then they are uh, but they can also be excreted out if they are smaller than five nanometers renally and then after that you can uh, uh, others also through the biliary duct. 
Okay. Um, question here on, uh, can you comment about the performance of DNA-based nanocarriers? Very interesting, very exciting stuff, but they're very, very early. Um, and I think small structures are being made. Uh, However, they are not. They are not going to be. They cannot be administered directly into the human body right now, uh, because they. You know, if you do, they'll be optimized. Anything in, in, injected in the human body will be eliminated almost immediately. Uh, will be optimized and then carried out and shuttled out. Of, uh, so um, they would have to be further processed, uh, you know, in order to make them long circulating and then to enter, to get into the disease site. And that's a long ways ahead. But of course, it's very exciting, you know. Um, there are a question here on uh, and, uh, how safe are inorganic nanoparticles over liposomes. I would say the only two that we work with are gold and silica um, and no, nothing else. Um, liposomes are primarily lipid based and all the components are uh, um, are, uh, 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 are of course biocompatible. I, I, I forgot to mention on the inorganic, the number one is iron oxide which is very biocompatible. You can administer grams of it. Uh, gold uh, is next and then silica after that. Um, have, you, have any studies been done to study the impact on um, microbiota. Um, yes, there's a lot of it. Uh, we've done some, you know, uh, I still have, uh, and, and that's a separate talk by itself. Aptomers and nano, which of these is patient friendly? Um, you know, I think aptomers, well, again, I don't want to, uh, I mean, there are people who are passionately committed to aptomers. Um, but I think there are some toxicity issues associated with them that need to be addressed. Um, what are the main strategies for targeting precisely the cancer cells? As I said, we target the tumors um, using um, the EPR effect or antibodies or magnetic targeting. Uh, and then further on, you can do further targeting inside for instance, when we deliver PARP inhibitors, they're only, they only act on, on uh, mutant deficient cells like BRCA negative, and they leave the other cells alone. So these are some of the overall strategies that we use. Um, so um, I think uh, I, at this point, um, I want to thank you all. Um, I've answered several of the questions that were uh, asked and, and I appreciate your uh, listening to me um, and I hope you all um, you know have successful careers in your uh, area of research and uh, good luck to you thank you very much